Okay, so the long-awaited moment has arrived. We're finally going to do some interactivity. Um, as our first example, we're going to talk about keyboard input. Um, keyboard is a really simple, easy to use input device. Every computer has one. Um, and we'll see throughout these examples, some forms of, um, of input are going to be better suited to certain kinds of interaction than others. Um, but we're going to start with keyboard here and then quickly talk about mouse and some other stuff like that. Um, so if you haven't watched the video um, previous where we talked about setting up an external code editor, you might want to stop and go ahead and do that first. Um, all the demos today are going to be using um, a code editor. I'm using Sublime Text. Um, of course, you could do this using the P5.js web editor. It would also work. Um, but for these demos, I'm also going to show you how we would do this locally on our computer. So I've created that template. I've got my sketch.js file open here, and I've got that index.html file open in my web browser. Um, so the reference is going to be a really important tool um, for a lot of this interactivity stuff. There's many um, ways of reading uh, inputs to your computer and that kind of thing. And so just having the reference open is going to be really helpful. If you look in the events section, you can see a bunch of different um, means of input. There's a bunch of keyboard stuff, mouse, of course, um, because the browser also works, you know, web is on your phone and tablet. There's also touch and um, things like acceleration. Um, and so there's tons of examples here. You can dig into the details and there's a lot of parameters and settings and stuff. Uh, but for now, so I've got this basic template set up and you might be thinking, okay, how do I, how do I read the keyboard? Well, luckily uh, P5.js has already given us a way of doing this. It's really easy. It's a function called key pressed. And every time you push a key on the keyboard, this function gets run. And uh, when it runs, one of the things that it does is it uh, populates or gives a value to a built-in variable called key. And so we could just say console.log key. And that's going to show us, print to the console, the value of whatever key was just pressed. Um, so it's kind of like width and height. It's a built-in variable to P5.js. So if I save my sketch, remember, you always have to save it before you reload it in the browser and then reload. And now when I'm pressing keys, you might be thinking, well, why am I not seeing anything show up? Um, in the P5.js web editor, the console is displayed by default. But in your web browser, it's, it's not, because um, most people don't need that. Um, and where you find this is going to vary depending on your browser. But on Chrome here, it's Command or Control Option I. And that pops up this whole thing here. And there's a whole bunch of tabs and things involved. Let's see, I think we can make it a little bigger. There we go. It's going to be a little hard to see. We're kind of squished here. Um, and I don't know why it's saying the word dead. I have no idea what that's about. Um, but now when I type keys on the keyboard, it is almost Halloween. Should I be worried? I don't know. Um, but when I type keys on the keyboard, it shows up. You'll notice it sees enter and number keys and special keys and tab and all of this stuff. Whoops. Um, anything that we type in here. And so you're going to probably want to have this console open as you're working because it's also where um, error messages and things like that are going to be displayed. Um, OK, so key press gets run every time we push a key on the keyboard. And this variable called key gets uh, shown. You'll notice that things like tab, um, et cetera, you know, those show up, these letters. But actually, under the hood, there's a standard called ASCII. Um, and this was developed in the 1960s, originally for teletype printers. Um, and it's a code, a numerical code for each key on the keyboard, as well as some of the special keys like spacebar and return. And actually, if you look for ASCII table, you'll find there's lots of websites that will give this to you. Um, you'll find this list of these key codes. So DES, D-E-C, this is decimal. Um, this is the one we would want. Um, and you can see, for example, null, no value has an ASCII number of zero, um, the letters and symbols, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you'll also notice a lot of characters or symbols that we don't use anymore, uh, like bell is literally a bell on the type or teletype machine that would get rung when it receives that character. Um, and the other thing you'll notice is 
um, what's missing here? So this is all like Western English language characters. There's no Enyes, there's no umlauts, there's no, certainly no um, characters outside of the English alphabet. Um, and this is a real limitation to ASCII. This is why Unicode was invented. This is a rabbit hole we're not gonna go down. But if you're interested, you know, these are very much the kinds of things that we talk about, the affordances of these systems. Um, but ASCII provides us this key code and so we can actually also see that. That's a variable called key code. Somehow I deleted my key variable here. So then if I save this and refresh my browser, now when I type the letter A on the keyboard, I get an A and 65. That's the ASCII code for A. B is 66. Capital, so we can see shift is 16. I push the shift key. Now if I push E, I get a capital E, which is 69 zero, et cetera, et cetera. So we can see both the key code and the letter. Um, now you might be thinking, well, why do I need the number? I don't care. Um, well, this is important, for example, with the arrow keys. We wanna know what arrow key is being pushed that doesn't have a graphical representation or return or shift or space bar or escape, something like that. We may wanna tie those keys to a function on our, on, in our code. Um, and in that case, reading the key value is not gonna be as helpful as this key code. So let's see some examples. Um, let's say first that we want to um, make this little, like draw a little square and have it move around with the arrow keys. So I can do fill, no stroke. Um, I'm gonna do rect mode center cause that's gonna allow me to draw this square from a central point like an ellipse and then, uh, or a square. And so I'm gonna need an X and a Y variable. So I'm gonna go ahead and make those global variables because I need to have them accessible to our whole program, X and Y. And after create canvas, I'm gonna put them in the middle. So X is width divided by two, Y is height divided by two. Now we couldn't do this up here because we haven't created the canvas yet, width and height don't exist. And then we can use that. Um, let's make it 50 pixels. So iterative coding is a really smart way to go. So I'm gonna save this and run it and just make sure it works uh, and it doesn't. Aha, I'm missing a comma here. You may be yelling at your screen already. Uh, and here we go. So, you know, again, this is a great example. Um, you wanna run your code, make sure it does what you want before you add a lot more stuff. Now I wanna use the arrow keys to be able to move this little guy around. And um, because I know my arrow keys don't, you know, don't have like a, new, a visual representation like an A or asterisk or something like that, I'm gonna use the key code for this. And I can use this inside an if statement. So I can say if key code equals, um, and P5JS is already, uh, let me just make this a little smaller, there we go, um, has given a, a special variable name to left arrow, the arrow keys and stuff like that. You can find it again under the reference for key code. So some of those are here. So if it's the left arrow, I wanna make the box move to the left. And so that would be subtracting, and I'm gonna do 10 for now. We can see how that looks. Else if key code equals right arrow. You know, and I'm a little squished here. Maybe we can make this, uh, normally I'm working, you know, on multiple monitors and I've got a little more room. Here we go, good. Um, so if we want to move the box to the right, that's going to be adding to its X. And then we can say if key code equals up arrow, Y minus equals, and down would be plus. And, you know, the more you do this, the more kind of like intuitive this becomes. Let's save that and let's try running this again. So I'm going to refresh. And now when I press the up arrow, it should print and it does uh, arrow up and the code of 38 and the square moves up, down. Nope, I typed something wrong. Down, down, that's not right at all. Down, arrow. This is what happens when I type and talk at the same time. Uh, but this is also why you need the console open because it's gonna show you those errors. Refresh, down works, left and right. So now we've kind of built this like I mean, that's not a game really, <laughs> but we can move this box around. That looks pretty cool. Um, 
let's think about another way that we might want to use this. So um, if we know our uh, key code is an ASCII value, and I can look at the ASCII table here and see that the number, the lowest number is zero, and the highest number is 127. We can use those numbers to trigger something in our code. And we've talked about the um, map command before. Map is, interactivity is all about mapping. It's about taking one input and its numerical values and converting it from that range to a, a useful range for something else. So if I know my key code is between zero and 127, we can use that maybe then as we type on the keyboard to have the background color change. So um, I'm gonna do this in a color mode called hue, saturation, lightness. Now we could do this in RGB, but RGB color, you know, if we're doing, um, you know, which one do we change? Do we just change red or blue or whatever? Um, hue saturation lightness or HSL um, is a totally different color model. So, you know, we think about RGB, CMYK, HSL is just another version of that. And we can set the hue, which goes from zero to 360. You can think of it as like a circle. Um, and that goes from, you know, all the colors of the rainbow all the way around. Saturation is how intense or saturated the color is, and lightness, of course, is then the brightness or value of that color. So we're going to leave um, our saturation at 100. That's the maximum amount. Uh, actually, we're not going to make variables for this because we can do this even more easily. All we want to change is the hue. So I'm going to say let hue equal, um, and then we're going to do a map. So we're going to map key code. And the input range we looked up in the ASCII table is 0 to 127. And we want our output range. Uh, the hue is, again, from 0 to 360. So we're going to say 0, 360. Pretty cool. Now, um, then if let's just print this. And again, we can see if this is doing what we want. So now if I type A, I get a65, that's the key code. And then it's mapped to this new range um, and it's giving me a value of 184 with a decimal. Um, and this is really helpful because it also tells us that map is giving us a floating point number with a decimal and we can't use that um, to change the color. It's gonna sort of break if we try to do that. So instead we need to convert the hue to an integer or a whole number. So I could say hue equals int hue, it's super easy. And then um, let's try printing that. So now if I press A again, now you can see it's giving me the floating point version and then the integer version, which is what we want. Super. So if we want to change the background color, then the last thing we need is a variable. So I'm going to say, I'm going to call it C. That's not very descriptive, but it's, it's fine for now. Uh, my background is going to be then set to C. Oh, you know, C probably needs an initial value, right? Like, otherwise it's going to break because it doesn't know what C is yet. Um, and, you know, before we have done, um, we've defined color using a string like this, RGB, and then given it a number, but we can also do HSL. So I'm going to do HSL. And let's for now make this um, right in the middle. So 180 degrees. 100% saturation and 50% brightness. And in fact, we can run that again and just see, cool, we get this kind of cyan color. If we were to change this, the hue to be zero, we would get bright red. And now our last step down here is that we can set C equal to this color that we've created with the keyboard. So C equals, and we're gonna kind of build a string here. So I've got, the HSL part, and then I'm going to put in hue, and then a comma, 100% saturation, 50% brightness, just like that. Save it, run it over here, and now when I press the letter A on the keyboard, my screen changes, X, etc., etc. So I'm just sort of typing on my keyboard. You can do capital letters, 
all these different things. Um, so maybe not like the coolest use of a keyboard, but I wanted to show you a few different ways that you might think about it. The arrow keys, of course, are an input we're really used to, um, but you can think of other creative ways of doing this. Um, and think about other stuff that you could add to this. Try adding some other, you know, changes. Maybe it's um, switching what kind of shape gets drawn or other colors or stroke on and off, stuff like that. Um, but that's keyboard input. In the next demo, we'll look at the mouse um, and some other more kind of gestural ways of inputting into the computer.